It was very difficult at, at first, you know, to work with these children and maintain that clinical position of not reacting, you know, not weeping, not showing that emotional side. Well, malnutrition is one of the largest problems that we have in the world. Uh, UNICEF and some other organizations estimate that we're losing 12 million children a year, maybe a million a month due to malnutrition and childhood diseases. It's this combination of things, but malnutrition is the substrate. At the end of the day, the children who feed on the quality protein maize grow better, are better able to withstand infections, and in fact show a better rate of growth than children on normal maize. See, and therefore, if all our communities that grow maize can switch over to growing quality protein maize, we would have come closer to solving our basic malnutrition problem. Maize is the world's most widely grown cereal crop. Just how important it is for nutrition in many regions of the world is shown in Ghana by a typical village in the Ashanti region. Kabriti has had virtually no agricultural development and people are largely dependent on maize for nutrition. There are some very nice things about villages. It is actually fun to sit under the trees and talk with people and reminisce and, and look at what their hopes are. And you get the feeling that this is the way to live. Why should we introduce anything else to them? And then when you see the price that is paid, the price that's paid because of illness, the loss of children early, it isn't that this has to be put up with. It, we no longer live in a fatalistic world where that's just the way it is. There are things that have changed in other parts of the world that could change here also. Dr. William Fagey is a world leader in public health who works through Jimmy Carter's Global 2000 program. Abnia Kwemabwating is head of nutrition for the Ashanti region of Ghana. This is her first visit to this village, but she immediately recognizes serious malnutrition. This child is just about two years old, and that is the mother who is very, very pregnant, maybe delivering any time from now. Now, this child, I must say, doesn't look too healthy. I mean, you just look at the hair. She even has an infection of the eye. She has a lot of pus under the eye. She has quite a big belly for her size. And it's not uncommon. You realize that such children have changes within, changes within the liver. In addition to that, they have a lot of worms. Uh, I was uh, surprised to find as much malnutrition as one could see obviously in children. And I realized that this is just before the harvest season, and so we're seeing the seasonal famine. Nonetheless, you come away discouraged by the amount of malnutrition because you know these children don't have another chance. Brain growth is maximum within the first two years of life. And this, if this child is underfed or not properly fed within the first two years, it does a lot to the person's mental development. And in fact, this cannot even be repaired. Why do mothers not see that their children are malnourished and rush for attention someplace? The problem comes on so insidiously that the mother may not one day suddenly notice that the child's malnourished. And then, if most children in the village also have the same condition, it looks to be normal. And some children that are very malnourished end up dying, but they often die with an acute illness. They die with measles or they die with diarrhea. And the mother isn't thinking malnutrition killed this child. The mother's thinking measles killed this child. You can see straight away that the mother herself is malnourished. And right now I can see that there's practically no milk in the breast. The child is only using it for solace sake. Babies younger than six months in this village generally look healthy. Their diet of breast milk contains all the nutrients they need to thrive. 
The danger time for them is after they are weaned from a few months old onwards. Hama prepares weaning food for her child, Idrisu. This is the universal weaning food for children in maize growing areas in much of the world. Most mothers tend to wean their children onto the maize gruel, which we call cocoa, which is made from maize, maize dough. The underlying problem is that maize is seriously deficient in two essential amino acids needed by the body to build proteins. For many millions of children in the world, this means a dangerous lack of protein at a critical stage in their growth. Without help, Idrisu is in great danger. His mother takes him to the new rehabilitation center at the Adjura Seki Bimase Hospital. This child is the second of three siblings. Um, she's been here. The most common form of malnutrition here is called kwashioko a Ghanaian word first used in 1933 by a British doctor, Cicely Williams. The word means that the child has been displaced from the mother's breast by the arrival of a new child, and so has been forced onto a diet of maize without additional protein from breast milk. Kwashi is for a male, and koko is a female, so kwashi has been put off the breast because koko has come. With kosher core, you have insufficient protein, insufficient amino acids, and it's as if the building blocks of the building are inferior. And you almost get this feeling that a child is crumbling. Their hair loses its color. It loses its thickness. The skin changes. They become scaly. They have uh, skin peeling. The blood supply no longer has enough protein to hold the liquid into the vessels and so it leaks out of the vessels into the surrounding tissue and pretty soon you get what's called edema where you can press on the child's foot, the top of the foot, and you get an indentation because there's so much fluid in the tissue. In some cases a child looks normal because the edema makes them look healthier and, and even a little bit fat. The fluid is a mask to what's happening at the cellular level, at the organ level. These, twins, if you don't These nine month old twins suffer from the other major type of malnutrition, marasmus. And by marasmic, you mean that they're not getting enough protein or enough calories? At all. Okay. They are all skin and bone. You know, they are all skin and bone. And you can actually count their ribs of the child. Marasmus is caused basically by starvation. Usually, the mothers, too, are malnourished. She had anemia, and it was obvious that it was quite severe anemia. We couldn't see this, but she undoubtedly had roundworms and whipworms and hookworms. My guess would be that she's had repeated bouts of malaria, repeated bouts of diarrhea. She has to farm, take care of the house, take care of those children. And I simply don't understand how a person has the energy to do that. On the other hand, what option does she have? My observation was that this is a, a real complex situation, that we have health problems, we have nutrition problems. Population pressure is a large part of this problem. This increases the competition for resources. The second problem is poverty. This is a problem of poverty. And the inequities are sharply defined during the seasonal famine period. Dr. Fagi was joined in Ghana by agricultural scientist, Dr. Norman Borlaug, who led the green revolution in Asia in the 1960s and is now promoting a new green revolution in Africa with the Sasakawa Global 2000 program. Part of their strategy is to tackle the root causes of malnutrition by replacing normal maize with nutritionally improved maize called quality protein maize, or QPM. All of these people make their livelihood from the soil. The only way they can improve their standard of living, 
not only for their own nutrition, is to produce more than enough maize. But if you can produce sufficient quantities of quality protein maize at no additional cost, that will help improve the nutritional value, you have the double advantage. Ghana's first QPM variety is known as Obatampa. It has been taken up with enthusiasm here, and many schools, like the Ya Asintewa Girls Secondary School, grow their own. I see I've got a very beautiful maize farm. What variety of maize are you growing? It's Obatampa, or quality protein maize. Dr. Chumasi and Ben Ja were two of the key people in the team which produced Obatampa. Can someone tell me exactly what happens when we feed this sort of maize to children? The children in Ghana are exposed to koshoko. They are normally exposed to koshoko. And since Obatampa contains a high quality protein, it reduces the a proportion of children who are going to have the koshoko. Why did you choose to grow obatampa? Uh -huh. Because of its high nutritional value. What does it mean? It's high quality protein because it contains um, lysine and tryptophan. Lysine and tryptophan are two of the 22 amino acids which are the building blocks of all proteins. Proteins are formed from long twisted chains of these amino acids. If one of them is missing when needed, the process stops. The protein cannot be made. Twelve of the amino acids, including lysine and tryptophan, are called essential amino acids because the human body cannot synthesize them. So they must be taken in as part of the diet. The levels of the essential amino acids in normal maize show a serious deficiency in lysine and tryptophan, and this limits the proteins which humans can derive from normal maize. In QPM, by contrast, the levels are nearly all higher and almost double in lysine and tryptophan, meaning that QPM has protein quality almost as good as skimmed milk. QPM is the culmination of a fascinating maize breeding story which began in the 1920s. Mutant varieties of maize were found which were highly opaque. The second such variety, re-examined over 40 years later, they labelled opaque too. It was thought to have no value. Then in 1964, a graduate student working at Purdue University called Lynn Bates under Dr. Mertz was testing a lot of these mazes. And he tested, among others, this opaque analyzing for tryptophan. And he found this one that was much higher, nearly double in tryptophan. And much higher in lysine, the two that were limited. Feeding trials with rats showed that fed on opaque two maize, they put on weight more than three times faster than on normal maize. And malnourished children also responded well and were nursed back to health. The opaque two gene was soon bred into a number of varieties which were rushed onto the market. But early excitement gave way to disappointment. The new maize had many undesirable characteristics. In particular, the kernels were soft and chalky. And then they found that there were a lot of other defects. The kernels being softer, the insects, both in the field and in storage, attacked them much more aggressively. Bigger losses. There were certain ear rots caused by fungi that were, made the ears rot. Uh, they gradually worked this out. But then they were still off 30%. 30% less yield was a serious problem. With this poor field performance and poor storage qualities, it soon lost its appeal both to farmers and seed producers. Despite these early setbacks, work continued in Mexico at CIMIT, one of the world's premier maize research centers, under the leadership of maize breeder Dr. Sarinda Vassal. Could the scientists retain the increased lysine and tryptophan, but breed out undesirable qualities like low yield, caused mainly by the soft, chalky kernels? Then they began to see that there were little islands, when you looked at those kernels with the light, that were vitreous, little islands in the chalky, soft, 
Crow. This crucial observation led to significant advances by cereal chemist Dr. Ivan Herlina Viegas. It is well known that cereal proteins are deficient in certain essential amino acids. She developed highly sensitive methods for analyzing lysine and tryptophan in the tiny vitreous islands. To do this, we use an electric drill to separate the small portions of the endosperm without damaging the embryo, which thereby permits normal germination. From the original opaque two, it took two decades of painstaking breeding to transform it by stages into a variety which looks exactly like normal maize. They called the new maize quality protein maize. Crucially also, the new maize yielded well and had great potential both for farmers and consumers. After all the false starts, QPM appeared to have arrived. But then came a hammer blow that severely set back further development. To the anger of supporters of QPM, Simit stopped all research, and the all-important QPM breeding materials were put back into storage. Their budget had been cut, and unproven technologies like QPM suffered the consequences. One argument in favor of cutting QPM was that adding extra lysine and tryptophan compromised potential improvements like pest resistance and higher yield. But the most bitter disputes were amongst nutritionists. Some claimed that there were simpler ways of adding lysine and tryptophan to food. Others strongly disagreed. They were on one side and they said, keep going, you're nearly there. And the other said, give them a piece of meat and an egg. And that seemed simple when budgets were being cut. For developing countries in the early 1990s, this all came at just the wrong time, as world population was forcing malnutrition to crisis point. Today, the crisis is even more severe. In the Ashanti region in Ghana, the worst cases of malnutrition end up here, in the children's hospital in Kumasi. This is not a drought or war situation. This is normal life for all too many children in sub-Saharan Africa. It takes a lot of emotional strength, you know, to come here every day, meet some children, come back the next morning and find out maybe three or four of those children are dead. You find children who don't even look like children, children who look like old men, you know, children that you don't expect, especially to find in the center of the capital, the second capital city of Ghana. You know, eh, 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 then, then you start asking yourself, what is happening? No, 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 no. no. Throughout the world, a million children a month die from malnutrition and childhood diseases. In sub-Saharan Africa, Ghana has less infant mortality than many countries and has made more efforts than most to combat the problem. I look at the length of the child and even the head. You can see all the veins sticking out. This shows that the child has got severe marasma. With these children, well, once in a while, you get down, like right now. I know that that kid there may not last till the morning. And, you know, I then start questioning myself, are we really doing anything to help these children? Okay, this is a four-month-old baby. This is the first time, in fact, for even me, seeing a child as young as four months coming in with Koshoko. The mother said this child stopped breastfeeding by herself at age one week, and she therefore resorted to giving the child porridge. And the porridge was just plain condo porridge with sugar and nothing else. Quality protein maize cannot hope to solve all of the complex problems of malnutrition, but it could just make the crucial difference for many children in maize growing areas. And as you can see, in fact, this child doesn't look well at all. Well, I will stick out my neck and say that I wonder if this child will survive. You know, we always have to go through that same cycle of seeing this child being ill, trying to advise, and then the child dying. Here we have um, 
Madame Kuya Sewa, and this is the child, Silas Anefi. Silas had an episode of diarrhea, recurrent diarrhea at, ele at age 11 months. And that is where you see on this card, you see the sudden drop. So we see the picture we see here today of Silas being very, 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 very marathmic. One contributory factor is that Silas was weaned at three months, right? And was weaned onto porridge, cocoa. So we do get sad, right? Now I'm not too happy about that child. And I know I'm going to keep on thinking about it till I get back on Monday uh, uh, to find out if the child is still there or has died. Scientists like Dr. Borlaug, who had witnessed at first hand the famines of the 1960s in India and Pakistan and passionately believed in QPM, were determined that it shouldn't be allowed to die. Through the Sasakawa Global 2000 program, SG2000, he initiated a plan to save QPM. Ghana was to be the testing ground for the new initiative and the Crops Research Institute in Kumasi the focus for research. As director of the Crops Research Institute, Dr. Emmanuel Addison opened the doors to this major effort on QPM with support both from SG2000 and the Canadian International Development Agency. The head of the QPM development program at the Crops Research Institute is Dr. Chumasi Afriyi. Ghana is a place where QPM will just fit in. It's a major staple in Ghana. Mothers use uh, meat as the first winning food. So when I looked around, I saw this is some new technology that would just fit in for my country. Selecting one of Simit's QPM varieties and improving it for the Ghanaian environment was the first priority. Breeders use a variety of strategies for concentrating desirable genes over many breeding cycles, so good ears are preserved and bad ears are rejected. Dr. Wayne Haig, director in Ghana for SG2000 and a former Simit maize breeder, gave wholehearted backing to the campaign. He joined this program in a large part because he was interested to see protein quality maize put into operation so that it would serve human beings, not as an academic exercise. And he's very well motivated for this. He wants to see this happen and he wants to see it happen soon. In the beginning, I was not particularly turned on by quality protein maize because of the yield gap. These materials, the opaque two materials, were simply not competitive with the normal maize varieties existing at the time. The two decades of maize breeding work at Simit changed his mind. It was very clear that a tremendous improvement had occurred over that space of time. And indeed, the materials looked very, very competitive with our best normal materials. In Ghana, a team was built from the best people available. An important contribution has been from retired maize breeder, Ben Jha. Ben Jha is, uh, we call him Mr. Maize. Too hard. Mr. Jha has been a consistent thread throughout the history of the maize program here in Ghana. This is a gut-fighting team of scientists that want to see this happen, that are determined to make it happen. Adapting the original Simit QPM varieties for local conditions took three years, improving, for example, resistance to the endemic maize streak virus. Yes, sir. High frequency of four husk cover. Husk cover, too, was very important. A loose husk cover means easy access for birds and insects with obvious damage. Like we have in this. This is what we want. We want the whole crop to be covered. At each stage of the many breeding cycles which are needed to produce a new variety, they had to ensure that the crucial increased levels of lysine and tryptophan were being preserved, otherwise the whole object of the exercise would be defeated. Here at the Crops Research Institute in Kumasi, they are testing kernels for tryptophan. The results show that high tryptophan levels have been maintained.
After three years of steady improvement, they were nearly ready with their first QPM variety. But first, it needed a name. A good name can make a big difference to a variety's success. I remember one time I've gone on trek and I was singing a song in my head. Then immediately it rocket me. This is a very good name for this variety because Obatampa means good nursing mother. Does Obatampa work for nutrition? At the University of Science and Technology in Kumasi, a litter of pigs is divided into two matched halves. One half is fed normal maize and the other half QPM. The results were dramatic. Dr. Stephen Okai checks their weights. After eight weeks of feeding, a normal pig weighs in at seven kilograms and a QPM pig at 12 kilograms. In fact, the QPM pigs put on weight twice as fast as the normal pigs. It was then at National Farmers Day in 1992 that they had some luck, which was to give a great boost to their campaign to get Obertampa onto the market. Jerry Rawlings, gone as president, noticed some pigs. Some fed on normal maize, the others on Obertampa. There was a huge difference in size. He was so impressed with this that he asked Dr. Chumasir to tell the crowd about Obertampa. He then insisted that the pigs were paraded on top of a van for everyone to see. It was the start of a strong government impetus to get QPM into the hands of farmers. The president had become a convert to the QPM cause and the country would follow. Seed production was the next stage. In Ghana, this is primarily done by small-scale producers like Gloria Dewar. She grows Obertampa seed exclusively and has found a good market for it. First of all, the variety is a good variety. It's high yielding, it's uh, disease resistant, but of course, if the variety were not, were not good agronomically, no matter how good it were or people imagined it to be nutritionally, it would not be acceptable to farmers. Currently, there are about a thousand ton of maize seed being sold, which probably only constitutes between five and 10% of the total maize seed planted by farmers every year. Now of this, about 500 to 600 ton of that 1,000 ton uh, is Obatampa seed or quality protein maize seed. And the demand is growing. I was just speaking with the seed program people uh, this year, they have sold out all of their stocks of uh, quality protein maize seed. I would like to see all of the maize on the earth becoming quality protein maize. And due to the success. But what about biodiversity? At the Crops Research Institute in Kumasi, Simit scientist Dr. Roberto Souza and guest QPM breeder Dr. Hans Givers from South Africa discuss potential problems with Dr. Chumasi and Ben Jar. Some people are saying that uh, we should be very careful that we shouldn't push over the back too much because if the crop occupies about 80-90% and something happens, mm -hmm. then yeah, there will be total be. disaster. For instance, in Nigeria, downing mildew is spreading very rapidly. Just as southern leaf blight had done in the United States in 1970, when 12% of the annual harvest was destroyed. If research has stopped and you don't have the material already prepared for that uh, you know, emergency, it will be chaotic. So to be remembered always is that we have a single recessive gene, yes. Yes, which if used in a single genotype, in a single hybrid over large areas, could become susceptible to some diseases. To combat this problem, CRI researchers have developed QPM varieties with a wide range of genetic backgrounds. In Ghana, they are developing new QPM varieties, as well as QPM hybrids, matching the best normal hybrids for yield.
An essential part of the process is to self-pollinate maize plants to produce highly inbred lines. When crossed with other genetically distinct inbred lines, the phenomenon of hybrid vigor creates exceptionally high-yielding plants. One good piece of news is that Simit is giving more support to QPM, making sure that its QPM breeding materials are maintained and available to researchers throughout the world. Research funding for QPM is critical. Investment in normal maize is many times more than in QPM, so is there a danger that QPM will lag behind in crucial areas like high yield? With conventional breeding techniques, the QPM character can be introduced into elite normal maize types, but it takes many years of breeding effort. Now Simit intends to use genetic engineering to accelerate this process, so any advances in breeding normal maize can be transferred rapidly into QPM. Niami Biechari is a village which has had a high level of agricultural intervention. QPM was introduced here three years ago, and this needed no change in lifestyle for the village, since the only difference between normal maize and QPM is its improved nutritional value. They came to see whether QPM can really fulfill its promise where it matters in villages like these. It was a very different experience from their previous visit in 1993, which was recorded by a member of their group. In Amibachere, when we went there, it was just, was just like any other Ghanaian village. Looking at children, you could just see the clinical signs of malnutrition, the reddened hair, very lean looking, that is underweight children. It's the first crop of QPM had not been harvested, so these children were normal maize. And right there and then, you know, we had this child who was showing the gross signs of koshoko. You see how all the hair has gone. Okay, the edema has gone down. Because the last time when we were here, you know, the feet were all so swollen. But now that this child is cold. The child is cold. This child just died in our hands. The child was gone. It's hard for a person from Western European countries to understand this. They have to see it. I would like to ask the question, how would you feel if it were your child? I know how I would feel if it were my child. Anger because I knew that there must have been thousands and tens of thousands and maybe millions of cases like this. I never saw this happening on the little farm where I grew up, uh, but it happens frequently here uh, and not just in Ghana. Ghana, I think, is uh, much better off than many of these countries. In Niami Biechari today, the picture is very different. Going back there, we saw that there has been a lot of changes. You could see that the children looked very, very healthy, healthier when compared to the children we saw in Kubriti the previous day. Uh huh. We could see signs of development. They now had a nursery school, which wasn't there when we went three years ago, offshoots of the program. And the only different thing that we had put in that village was the QPM seed that we had given, which came along with an agricultural package of uh, good technical advice. Local agricultural extension officers review the new harvest with members of the Sasakawa Global 2000 team. Not only is the village now growing QPM, but they also get much bigger harvests. We have uh, discussed and agreed in general on how to improve the total food intake for the children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when this is done with quality protein maize, you automatically uh, correct those imbalances in deficient amino acids. But we've still got to correct it in the nutrition of the plant. 
Yes. We've got to go back to the worn out soils, which need to be uh, replenished with nutrients, yes. commonly called fertilizer. Oh, absolutely. And if we don't get that, we can't increase the production of normal maize or quality or protein maize. Yes. And the world has to recognize this. Sir. Have you convinced your government that we need fertilizer? Has your government convinced the World Bank that there's no other solution to the growing world food problems without fertilizer to restore plant nutrients to the soil because plants too need nutrition. Maize is important for human nutrition, not just in Ghana, but worldwide, particularly in developing countries. Today, QPM is only grown commercially in China, Vietnam, South Africa, Ghana, Brazil, and the United States. QPM's future hangs in the balance. It is now at a critical stage where it needs more backing in research and development to really take off on a much wider scale. We need a little extra support. And with the success that's coming now, I'm hopeful that this is forthcoming soon. It better be soon. I don't know how many years I got left here. I had about given up, but when I saw what our friends here were doing with mace, now I'm, I've made up my mind that I'm going to stay around here and live a couple, three more, five years, hopefully, to see this really become what it should have become 10 years ago. It takes an entire world to raise a child not just a village, it takes an entire world. The interdependence of malnutrition in a village in Ghana to what is happening in London is there if people will only see it because poor people are subsidizing us. The same thing is true with poor countries subsidizing rich countries. We have to see this as a global problem where we all have some responsibility. At times it looks as if we're not doing enough. I don't know if it's not that we are not doing enough or enough is not being done by you know, the policy makers, et cetera, to make sure that you know, things that give rise to this final picture do not happen. People who can do a lot about it are not really concerned about it. And that really makes those of us who have to deal with the final outcome very angry. The children are sick, the lives are short. That they mm -hmm. I wish I were 10 years younger. But even at my stage in life, uh, I say it's got to go. We've got to get the funding and support to make it go.